Hi, I'm Indy Nidell, and this is another exciting episode of Out of the Trenches, where I sit here in the Chair of Wisdom and answer all of your questions about World War I. And here are some questions from our Patreon supporters. Uh, Matt Tantillo writes, Phenomenal work you guys are doing. Thanks. And thanks for letting us contribute to what will be a great four years and beyond. Oh, yeah. Uh, here are my questions for you. What did the Western Front look like at its northern extreme along the European coast? Was there an early version of Fortress Europe which spiked the seashore? Did the Navy support non-amphibious ground supports at all? Forces at all? Did armies ever try to flank each other by going around the end of the line via the sea? They did, and it was an important part of the war uh, in the fall of 1914. After the Germans had been stopped at the Battle of the Marne, the Allies and the Germans tried to outflank each other as trench lines grew further and further north, and this was called the Race to the Sea, and it ended at the coast in Belgium, creating trench lines that ran all the way from the sea down to Switzerland, and then you couldn't outflank anybody. And he has another question. Uh, what kind of propaganda was used by various sides, especially once the quick victory was lost and people were losing sight of a glorious victory? Anything and everything, pretty much. Um, there were campaigns to shame men into joining up, suggesting they were unmanly if they didn't join. There was the distribution of disinformation or outright lies, claiming that they, whoever they happened to be, were doing better than ever and victory was within sight, you know, just around the corner. There was bartering. Um, the Russians, like, offered citizenship and things to Jews who joined them in the armed struggle. There were attempts to get neutral countries like the U.S. to join the war. And there were, above all, I think, campaigns to paint enemy actions in the most negative light possible, that the enemy were butchers, and even though it took so much time and so many men, that enemy must be defeated simply for civilization to survive. Zephyr writes, I've been wondering for quite a while now, where do you get all the footage for these videos? Oh, we get it from the British Pathé Film Archives. We'll give you a link below, and it's really cool to just go there and just look up stuff. Type, like, beetles or type, type anything. Type hair, and you'll get, like, 50 awesome videos from the 50s and 60s. It's really cool. Uh, another Patreon supporter question. Xenophone writes, Hello, Indy and company. Hello, Xenophone. Uh, starting off in the Week 24 episode, you mentioned that one of the greatest challenges the Austro-Hungarian army faced in fighting the Russians in the Carpathians was the poor railway infrastructure in the region, which didn't allow the Austro-Hungarian army to properly reinforce and resupply. Yes, we did mention that, yes. If such were the hardships that Austro-Hungarian forces faced, then how did the Russian army reinforce and resupply so far away from home while also fighting in the Carpathians, which suffered from the aforementioned poor infrastructure? They didn't. They, they didn't. Russia was kicking all kinds of ass when they were fighting on their side of the mountains. But as they pushed the Austrians back, deeper into the Carpathians and back to the Austrian side, they, they suffered, the Russians suffered the same problems of supply and transport. One big difference was that the Russians were far better equipped for war in both winter and the mountains, but resupplying in the Carpathians would be a logistical nightmare for anyone. Second, how did the 100,000 Austro-Hungarian soldiers trapped in the fortress of Przemysl withstand the Russian siege for so long? Considering their vast numbers, how did they resupply when they were completely encircled by the Russian army? Surely no army carried enough supplies to last out for months. Well, to say that conditions at Przemysl were miserable would be an understatement. They lived off of horse meat and fillers. They lived basically off of anything they could get their hands on for months. And the fortress was only made to hold about half the amount of people it ended up holding. Now, planes could fly in and out, but they couldn't help much. But the answer about resupplying was simply, they didn't, they couldn't. If you like history in general, you can check out our sister channel, It's History, right here. Don't forget to subscribe. See you next time.